Um, so uh, reminder again, homework, project number one is due today at midnight. Uh, we've been working on the scoreboard uh, to get the sort order incorrect, because obviously you want the person who has the fastest implementation to be at the top. But if you have the fastest implementation, you have the lowest runtime. So we have to normalize it by flipping things. Uh, and I think currently Joy is the fastest. Uh, that's not good if the TAT is beating you, right? Um, and so they, as we said, we'll, we will give the top five uh, implementations the, uh, some bonus points, right? So everyone's going to get, you know, uh, as long as you're above some threshold, you'll get the full points. And then anybody who's a little bit better than that will get some bonus points. And if Joy is within the top five, we'll look at the top six. Okay, um, and I know there were some issues about the, you would submit things and the scoreboard wouldn't refresh correctly. And I, as far as I know, that's all been fixed, right, Joy? Yeah. Uh, just to make it clear, I was actually like fighting for the top spot. Yeah. <laughs> so he wrote this in his underwear, you know, back in January, in his parents' basement in India, and he's beating you. So that's not good, right? Uh, but although it is Joy. Okay. So, so any questions about pro project number one? Again, due at midnight, and then for every 24 hours that you're late, you get 10% off. Um, but I think most people have submitted, submitted so far. So for today's class, we're going to switch from what we talked about last week. Last, last week was all about doing indexing for all OTP operations. And now we're going to focus on specialized indexes that are designed to make analytical queries run faster. Um, and so we'll see what the different trade-offs, what kind of things we care about in these, this type of environment versus the, the OTP stuff we were looking at before. And then the paper you guys read was for uh, Microsoft SQL Server. I think they talked about being the Denali release, but I think the code name of the project is Apollo. And this is basically adding columnar indexes to SQL, uh, SQL Server to make it run faster for OLAP queries. And so I'll, I'll probably flip back and forth by calling them projection indexes or columnar indexes. They're basically the same, same thing. And then I'll spend some time and segue into talking about bitmap indexes. Bitmap indexes are uh, another way to succinctly represent data in a column store system. Uh, the part of the reason why I didn't have you guys read a paper about bitmap indexes is because I couldn't really find a good one that really laid out all of the, you know, the gritty, nitty gritty details of, these, of this, this approach. So we'll go over at a high level what, what you need to know about them. And then we'll finish up in the remaining time and talk about uh, project number two, which is now out on the website, uh, which everyone will, will do after, the, after today. Okay, so in the paper, uh, they were talking about doing analytical operations on this decision support systems, or DSS applications. And the basic idea of what a, of a decision support system is that it's an application that's designed to help humans make decisions about their organization, right? So you look at the historical data of all, all everything you've collected from the front end OLTP application. Right? All your transactions are updating the database and adding new information. And then you want to look at all that history and ask questions and make decisions based upon that. So the, the, the example that Stonebreaker always likes to use is, say, you're, you're Walmart, and you have, a, uh, you have a database of everything that anybody's ever bought at a Walmart store. And you know there's a hurricane coming up in, in Florida. So you want to look back in history and say, when the last time I had a major hurricane in this, in this area, what was the most bought items, you know, one week before the hurricane and one week afterwards? And then you would use that and see, look, look at the listing of those items, and then that's what you would use, you know, make decisions about how you stock your store. Right, so essentially, these, D these DSS systems are providing you sort of big tables, and it's still up to you to infer meaning from that. This is different than, like, the machine learning data science stuff that's sort of the hot thing now. Uh, because in, in, a, in a machine learning system, instead of providing you a table that says, here's all the items that have been bought, you want to compute a model that can then predict, you know, you can ask it questions about what should you, you be stocking and make better decisions, right? Instead of having a table, you have a, a more compact um, representation of the data. And so in these DSS systems, we're just going to be doing joins and aggregations. We're not doing the linear algebra you would be doing in a, in a machine learning system. That's a whole other ball game that we're going to ignore for now. And so another thing in the paper is they refer to things being either a star schema or a snowflake schema or a star schema query. So I want to go over a quick high-level overview of what that actually means. So in a star schema, uh, the basic idea is that you're going to have some center table, which you call the fact table, that's going to contain all of the events that you've been recording for your application. So again, in case if you're, if you're Walmart, your fact table is going to be every single time somebody scans something uh, at a checkout line, 
you're going to store a new event that says this is what the thing that the person bought. And then around the fact table, you're going to have what are called dimension tables. And these dimension tables are like the metadata or additional data about things that are in the fact, the fact table. So for example, you would not want to embed the name of every single product that you buy in the fact table. You would then, you would normalize it out into the, to one of these dimension tables. Right? So in this part here, you'd have some information. Uh, you'd have foreign key pointers to the dimension tables, but then you have some additional information that's unique to the event that occurred. So in this case here, again, we have a foreign key reference to the product table, and then we have a product dimension table on the outside that it contains the, every information about the item that the person bought. Right? And we do this because uh, someone's going to buy a product a million times, and we don't want to have a denormalized table with you know, that product information stored a million times for every single event. Right? This fact table could be billions of things, whereas the dimension tables are usually uh, smaller. So this is different than a, a snowflake schema. Uh, in a snowflake schema, you basically can expand out dimension tables to have their own dimensions as well. So before we had in the product dimension, it had some information about what category the product was in, like what, you know, what manufacturer it is in, what, what aisle it could be in. And then we can expand that out to have a lookup table coming out of the dimension table with additional information. Right? So it's the same thing. It's just that the, the, in, the snow, in the star schema, you only sort of have one level of dimensions on the outside. In the snowflake schema, you have, can have arbitrary number of dimensions. Okay? So what are some trade-offs here? Why would you want to use a snowflake schema versus a star schema? When would a star schema be faster than a, snow schema, or a snowflake schema? Or why would it be faster? Again, think about the analytical queries you're doing in a decision support system. You want to say, again, assuming you're Walmart, what are all the items that somebody bought uh, before a hurricane? Well, here's all the items that, here's, here's all the sales of things. Then I want to go beyond that and I'll join this with the product table and see what those products were. And then maybe infer some additional information about you know, who was the manufacturer of them and can I get them to the store in time, right? Or how many do I have in stock and things like that. And so, Typically, what, what in, in most enterprise applications, you would use a, a star schema because you can reduce the number of joins you would have to do. Yes, you're going to denormalize the, cat, the product category table to be in the, this product dimension table. And yes, you have some repeated values, but the number of products that Walmart sells pales in comparison to the number of items that it's ever sold in total. Right? So we can denormalize these two things, and we pay a little storage cost overhead, but now we don't have to pay a runtime cost when we execute queries to do to do an n-way join, right? We can do these two-way joins across, uh, between the, the, the fact table and the dimension table. So this is sort of what the, 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 the paper you guys read is trying to solve, right? How do you take a star schema or a snowflake schema and run really fast with it? And without having the columnar indexes that they propose, you could only pretty much use B plus trees. And B plus trees have problems when you have really large tables. So let's say that we have a table of all the customers that, that, that have been to our store, and we're storing some basic metadata about them, right? So we, here's all the items that they bought. We have a sales fax table, and then we can combine them with the dimension table for customers. And let's say that we're keeping track of what zip code the customer lives in. So now if you want to do a query that says, find me, count the number of items that have been bought by people that live in zip code 15217, your two choices are to either do a sequential scan across uh, every single customer dimension to find all of the customers that live in uh, 15217 and then build some kind of hash table to do a hash join with the fact table. Or you could have a B plus tree on the zip code uh, to, find, to quickly find for a single zip code, here's all the customers in it. But now, say you have a million people that live in 15217, you have this B plus tree that is relatively shallow and not that wide, but then it's going to have these linked lists of these value lists with a million entries. Right? So there's all this wasted space for, for this particular query. And this is sort of an example why B plus trees aren't going to solve the problems we need to face in, in a decision support system. Okay? So this is sort of where, where this is where this, the SQL Server guys are going, is because they would have these B plus trees. But for analytics, it doesn't, you don't want to do this. OK, so the uh, SQL Server 
it is traditionally a row storage system. Remember, it's provenance. We talked about this. SQL Server is actually based on the source code of Sybase. In the early 90s, Microsoft licensed the Sybase source code to build a port of Sybase for Windows NT. And eventually, it came, became some kind of arrangement, uh, arrangement where Microsoft became the steward of the Sybase port of, on, on Windows. And then they rebranded it, and that became SQL Server. What's sort of ironic now is Sybase is con kind of stagnant, right? Like, you know, Sci uh, SAP bought them. And yes, they're sort of maintaining existing applications, but it's not really you know, the forefront of, I say, we're newer, newer database technology. Whereas SQL Server is now one of the top three database systems. And you see this, this Apollo stuff you're reading here. We've got the Hecaton stuff. They're doing a lot of really cool stuff to make it a modern database system. So even though SQL Server came from Sybase, it's kind of uh, surpassed it in its performance and capabilities. Um, so the basic idea with these columnar projection indexes are going to do is that you're going to decompose the, the row store database of tables and split them out into column segments. So you're going to take all the values for, for a particular column in a, in a table, and you're going to store them contiguously uh, in memory or on disk. Um, and so what's going to happen is in this first approach, in this initial implementation you guys read, you, when you say, I want a columnar index for a table, SQL Server would make that table become read-only. I mean, you're not allowed to update it. Right? And they have to do this because they're going to have no way of being able to, in this first implementation, to map changes to the row store back into the column store. Right? And we'll see this later on when we talk about uh, how they get around this in the future systems. But when, when you think about how, when they build these columns, they're taking a static database and they're doing one pass on it to build it out and build these columnar indexes. And there's, nothing, there's no sort of extra information laid around to say, like, if you have to modify it, here's how to go, to, go find the single tuple you're looking for. Right? And they're, doing, they're giving up this because they want to be much faster for the analytical queries. You may think this is kind of cheap. Why would anybody you know, want to do this? Why would you release sort of a, a half-baked product or a half-baked feature? Um, it's very common in database systems for sort of companies to put out a, an initial idea, an initial implementation that maybe doesn't work all the way you, that you want it to, but at least started getting it in customers' hands, get feedback for how they actually end up using it. So MemSQL sort of did the same thing too, right? They have their own auxiliary column store, and when you use it, you have to declare the table read-only in the same way. But eventually, they'll be able to make it so that you can modify it. And everyone, we'll talk more about this ne uh, next class, but there's sort of a standard approach about how you would be able to modify a column store system uh, when, you, when, you, when, you, uh, when you use these kind of indexes. Um, so another cool thing that I like about the paper is that they make a big effort to reuse as many existing components that are already in the database system without doing a major rewrite. So rather than sort of do what Vertica did was start from a completely brand new system and write it from scratch to be a column store system, they look to see how can we take a, our existing system and bolt on this column store stuff without throwing away everything else. And because the reason why you want to do this is because there's this whole ecosystem designed around SQL Server, and if you come along with a new database system, then you can't reuse any of that. So for example, like Microsoft owns Crystal Reports, which is sort of like a standard uh, data visualization package that a lot of people use. So if you had to write a whole new database system, then things like Crystal Reports or Tableau or other things like that would no longer work. So they want to be able to use, you know, have this thing work seamlessly inside the system, and from the outside it looks and sounds and smells like Postgre or, uh, SQL Server, but the inside has been completely rewritten. Okay, so we'll talk about how what they do later on to get around this problem of everything being read-only. So here's basically the outline of, of how the thing is going to work. So we have our existing row store table. And so our first thing we're going to do to build, our, build out our columnar indexes is that we're going to split the table up into row groups. So each row group is going to have roughly about a million tuples is, is what they use. And then for each row group, we're going to take the values within the, for a particular column within a row group and create a column segment. So in this case here, you can specify which columns you want to index. So we have four A, B, C, D, but you can specify I only want to be built an index for, for three of them. And then for each of these uh, column segments within a row group, we're going to pass this through a component that will encode and, and encode and compress them. And we'll talk about what those encoding schemes and compression schemes look like in a second. And then we're going to store this in the regular you know, row-oriented blob storage mechanism or blob storage system subsystem of the database uh, system and have some catalog information that allows us to 
identify for, you know, for this particular row group and this column segment, here's the blob that contains everything that I need. And the reason why they're storing it in the, the, so the, 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 the built-in blob mechanism is that that's going to allow them to reuse all the components in the system to do replication, fault tolerance, logging, and recovery, right? You don't have to write your own recovery manager for these col column indexes. Uh, everything can just sort of, you know, re be reused. You can use all the existing uh, infrastructure that's already there, which is really nice because it limits the amount of you know, work you have to do to, to add in something like this. We'll see in next class how Oracle does sort of something similar, but they take a different, different approach. And it's a, something called fractured mirrors, and we'll talk about how to do that in a second, or ne next class. Okay, so to keep track of all of these column segments for the col columnar indexes, uh, we're going to have this segment directory that's going to maintain statistics about every single column segment that it has. So you keep track of the size, the number of rows, the number of tuples you have, the min and the max values, and any kind of metadata you need about how you compressed or how you encoded it. Yes? The size you're talking about there is physical size. Physical size, yes, on disk. Right. So I should also qualify this by saying uh, this is a disk-based implementation. There's, there's nothing about what they're doing that would preclude us from being able to do this in an in-memory system. And so I'm sort of ignoring all that uh, for now. Um, but yes, they'll keep track because they want to be, say, like, you know, how many, they want to use this for cost estimations when they, when they, when they do query planning and things like that. And I think also, too, for if you're doing like on-disk allocations, you need to be able to like pre-plan and things like that. Okay. The min and max stuff is kind of interesting because let's say that you're doing a query and on a range, then when you look over your column segments, you can say, oh, I, I can ignore anything within this range because it doesn't fall within my, my min and max. So it's sort of like a materialized view to keep track of like, here's everything you expect to see within, you know, within a column segment. Vertica does something similar. Uh, uh, I think MemSQL might do something similar. This is sort of another standard approach. Just, um, and then we're also going to have a data dictionary for the dictionary encoding scheme, and I'll show what that looks like in a second. The basic idea is that we're going to pack in with the compressed column segment. We'll also include the dictionary we need to be able to reverse the dictionary encoding and get back the original values. And then rather than having a global dictionary, we're going to store it within as, as a single column segment. All right, so we're going to talk more about dictionary encoding later on the semester when we talk about database compression. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, a bunch of different you know, uh, encoding schemes. But for this, I just want to give a high-level overview of what dictionary encoding is. Um, it's probably the most common compression scheme used in an analytical system. Uh, Blue does this. HANA stores everything uh, in, 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 in dictionary encoding. So this is, this is a pretty standard technique, and it's pretty easy to understand. So the basic idea is that we're going to have as we pass through the data and we build out our column segments, we're going to keep track of all the, the, the unique values that we see for this column. And then we're going to maintain a separate table, like a hash table or a lookup table that says, uh, for a particular offset in my table, here's the value that it corresponds to. So now when you build out the column segment, uh, you, you, the, the, column, the column segment for the index, you don't actually write the original value, you put in the offset of the original value that corresponds, the, to corresponds with, with, what it, with what it is in the, in the uh, table. So this is going to allow us to take an arbitrary long string, and instead of storing all the bytes for it, we can just store a 32-bit uh, integer that corresponds, again, to where it exists in the, in the dictionary. So let's look at an example here. So we have two columns. We have sort of the, the user ID, and then we have the, the city that the person lives in. And as you can see here, we're storing things like New York, Chicago, and Pittsburgh over and over again multiple times. So this is essentially wasted space because we're storing the same byte sequence for all, for all these attributes. So under dictionary encoding, what we'll do is we'll first build a, a dictionary that says, here's all the attributes that I've seen, and then there's an offset that corresponds to, to that particular value. Then, so now in, in, the, in the column index itself, instead of storing the var char, we'll store the ID that, that corresponds to where it is in the dictionary. We can also keep track of the number of times this value occurs. So in this case here, we have New York five times, Chicago twice, and Pittsburgh once. And we can use this to make decisions about what numbers we should, you know, what order we should put the dictionary in. Right, we'll talk about dictionary encoding in, in further details later on. But you could, you could sort these things based on how often they occur. You could sort them based on the lexical graphical order of the actual value itself. Right? So that would allow you to do range queries to be able to just do a binary search on the dictionary itself to then be able to find the tuples that you want. Um, there's all these different ways to do this. There's no one, no one way is better than another. But the basic idea is the same. 
right? Instead of storing the var char, we just store an integer, and we can use the dictionary to find what the original value was, right? So then now instead of storing like you know a 32-byte var char, we want to store a 64-bit uh, integer or even 32-bit integer. Okay. The other type of encoding that SQL Server supports is called value-based encoding. Um, this is sometimes called delta encoding. What they do is slightly a little different than traditional delta encoding, but the, the basic idea is the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a numeric column, you know, kind of integer or a decimal, and we're going to convert it into a smaller value that allows us to store it with less, less bits than it would, we would have if, if it was uncompressed. So the idea is that we're going to split the domain of the columns that we see, or the values we see in a column segment, and we want to reduce them to be a smaller amount, and then we maintain some metadata to say, if you need to get back to the original value, here's how to go back to it. Right? When delta coding, one way to think about this is, say I have the number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, instead of storing uh, those whole numbers, I just store the original value at the beginning of the chain, and then just plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. Right? The difference in that case is that in order to get to the, say, the last value, I have to decompress the beginning of the chain, whereas in value-based encoding, I just need to have the, the, the global information and do the transformation without having to uncompress anybody else. So let's look at the two examples uh, that they have in the paper. So the first is to take decimals. So instead of storing now 64-bit floats, we can store 32-bit or even less integers. So say we have decimals 0 0.5, 10.77, and 1.33. The first thing we need to do is come up with an exponent that we're going to use to reduce the size of the, uh, of the integer, or in this case, making decimals, at least make them whole numbers. So in this case, here we'll take 3 because it's 10 to the 3. And then in our initial coding pass, we will multiply all the decimals by that 10 to the 3. So now we no longer have floats. We just have uh, whole numbers. And then we're going to choose a base to be sort of the starting point, the lowest value of our collection of numbers. In this case here, the lowest number is 500. So now in our final encoding, uh, we'll take the initial encoding value when we, when we multiply by the exponent and subtract the base value. And then we would end up, the first entry would always be 0. And then the subsequent entries will be some, some number greater than that. Uh, shouldn't that be true? Shouldn't what be true? That's the first exponent. 10 to the 2 is, is 100. Yeah. Right, 10, 10 to the uh, 3 is 1,000. No problem. It should be 1.333 in the values. The last value should be 1.333. That's what you're using in the encoding. Uh, I say this should be what? 1.33. 3, 3. three. three, three. Uh, I'm missing another 3? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Minor thing. Okay. Um, Right? Again, the main thing to remember about this is like we, uh, we don't want to store 64-bit floats. We could store this, I think 10, what is that? We could store that with uh, 9 bits. Uh, we, we wouldn't do that because then we wouldn't be word aligned. So we'll have to use, we could use 64-bit integers for these. Right? And again, think of these long segments. Most of the numbers may be around, hovering around the same thing. Right? Think of like if you're, if you're storing temperature data. Right? Whether it's Celsius or Fahrenheit, doesn't matter. Most of the numbers are going to be roughly close to each other. So this can reduce the amount of you know, data you have to store for, for this. Dollar amounts is another good example of, of where you can use this. For integers, the, it's the same basic idea. In this case here, rather than making whole numbers, we want to come up with a way to reduce the, the, the magnitude or the, reduce the size of them. So our exponent is going to be negative 2. And that will put uh, most of these numbers to single digits, or it would be less than 100. So 500 will go to 5, 1,700 will go to 17, and then that guy goes to 13,000. And then same thing, we'll pick the lowest number, and that becomes our base. We subtract everything, and then we get a, a, again, a compressed value. Again, we can do this because we're building out the column segment uh, from static data. So we're, you know, the, the DBA says, I want a column, columnar index. We do our pass, and we can compute all these things. This becomes tricky now if you have to do updates, and this is why, part of the reason why they're not going to support them, is if, I, if I, now I insert 400, that should be my base, not 500, because that's going to be a lower value. And so if I wanted to recompute, if I, if I got a lower value and had to update this, I would have to do another whole fleet pass over the column index and update everything. Right? And that gets really wasteful if you have a single insert. Yes? So 
So the question is, is this encoding only done in column stores? Uh, this type of encoding, yes. Uh, because usually what happens is in a row store, you don't compress the data because when you do an insert, it's like a transaction is only going to insert a small number of things at a time, right? And so if you had to, exactly what I just said before, if you had to do recomputation of the value encoding bases for every single time you update things, that just slows down all your transactions. So typically what happens is you have a row store that, that gets all the new updates where you do all your inserts and, and deletes and, uh, and updates. And then you have a background thread that then apply changes to the column store side of things, right? So what you could do, let's say that uh, I could do this encoding on my columnar indexes. And then if I get any inserts or deletes, then that doesn't change my encoding. Right? Any insert would go into a, its own row group, and therefore I can do the encoding for that. Uh, for any deletes, I can just mark a bit and say, ignore this tuple, and it does, doesn't affect any of the, the values. For updates, we've got to be a little more careful about how we do it. So you could do sort of what some multi-version concurrent control systems do, where do a delete followed by an insert. It's the same thing as an update. So yeah, the, the, main, the, so the main answer to his question is, you don't do this kind of compression or encoding on a row store because it's slow. And the data can be changed quite often. But we do this in a column store because, again, we don't, in an analytical system, we don't care about single entities, right? We care about large swaths of data, right? So, like, Facebook doesn't care about what you as an individual do, do or, you know, you know, what your attributes look like. They just look at the entire segment of things, right? So then in that case, you're not, since you're not doing point queries to go grab single things, you can do this kind of coding. Or, like, a few years ago, I, I went to go visit a, um, like an Internet advertising company, and they basically told me, like, they, they group all their entities into like 35 you know, categories. So every person can fit into like 35 groups. And that's enough, that's accurate enough then that it'll figure out you know, what's the right ad to show you. Right? So for like my group might be like you know, middle-aged white men, they're like overeducated and whatever. And they'll show me some ad. Joy's might be like you know, Indian computer science student that's DTF and they'll show them a different ad. Right? So like there's... Again, the main thing about it is in this kind of thing, we're not doing individual lookups, we're doing aggregates. So therefore, this compression stuff works. It doesn't work on a row store because you're changing things all the time. You're trying to get single things. Okay? All right, so the other compression scheme that they're going to be able to support is called run length encoding. And this is probably the, one of the most common approaches that are used in, in these types of systems beyond dictionary encoding um, because you get the most bang for the buck if, if you're smart about it. And the basic idea is that we're going, to, we're going to, instead of storing each individual attribute one by one, we're going to see if we can store a summarization of when we have duplicate values in our column. All right, so now instead of sorting individual values, we'll say in a triplet, here's the value that, that starts at the sequence, here's the offset of where I am in my column, and then here's the number of times this thing's re repeated. All right? And so the key thing about to understand on this is that in order to get the maximum amount of, of, of compression using run encoding, it requires your columns to be sorted in a smart way. All right, so let's look at an example. So let's say that we have our customer data again, and now instead of, instead of zip code, we're going to have what sex they are. For, for, for simplicity reasons, we'll just say it's male and female. So w if we want to do run length encoding on this, we would end up with these triplets here that would say, here's the value. Here's the starting point in the, in the column where, where we're, we're looking at, and then here's the number of times it's repeated. So what we see in this example here, uh, and, and never mind that you know, male and female can be stored as, as a single bit, but we see that there's this middle part here where we have sort of one female record, one male record, followed by another one female record. So we're storing this triplet to represent three tuples, and this is a lot of wasted space, right? Because each triplet would be, say that that's eight, eight bits, uh, that's 8 bits, and then another bit. So, you're, you know, 17 bits to store one value, which could have been stored as one bit. And so the way these systems get around this is that you do pre-sorting on the column to now have all of the, the males in, in a single run followed by the females. So now when you do run length encoding, you only have two entries here. So you have one male record starting at position 0, and I have six of them, and then one female record starting at position 7, and I have two of them. So this is sort of a toy example. Now think about it, if you have like a billion users, right? So you could represent uh, the, the sex of a billion people with two triplets. It's amazing. 
right? And so what makes running the coding tricky is that the optimal sorting scheme or sort order for a particular column to maximize its run length encoding possibilities is, can be affected or is different than what another column would want. Because when we sort this column here, we also have to change the position of all the values in the other columns. Because right? we, we want to be able to say at position 4, you know, across all the column indexes, here's the values for it. So we sort from male, male to female for this column. That may be the absolute terrible thing to do for another column. So in the paper, they talk about how they have this you know, trademark algorithm like VertiPack or something like that. And that's basically what it's doing, sort of an MP, MP complete problem to figure out the optimal sort ordering of all your columns that maximizes the overall rung length encoding possibilities you get for your entire table. So Vertica is another system that does, does stuff, stuff like this. And I think possibly DB2 Blue as well. So we're going to come up, come up with this rung length encoding stuff later on again. But this is probably, I, think, I mean, this, when you think about this, it's so awesome because if I want to know whether the per person at position four is male or female, it's trivial to look that up. I don't have to do any scan or anything, right? And of course, that thing can sit in a single cache line, and it's a quick comp uh, comparison. So the, again, the, to make these columns, column, columnar indexes, projection indexes work in SQL Server, they had to do more than just actually store them. They actually had to go and modify the query planner and the optimizer to become aware of what these indexes are and what they can provide. Right? And so the other thing they had to do as well was because SQL Server was traditionally a row storage system, that means they were doing the tuple at a time iteration model of processing queries in their operators. They had to have additional operators to do batch at a time or a vector at a time. And we talked about that earlier that you know, when, you call, when an operator calls get next on its child operator, it's not going to get back a single tuple. It's going to get back a large chunk of tuples. Because right, again, we're doing OLAP queries or scanning large segments. We don't care about getting single things. We care about getting a lot of data as, as possible and doing our operation directly on that. The other cool thing that they did was they added the ability to do, uh, and this is, but this is standard in OLAP systems, is in order to compute joins efficiently, they can compute bitmap vectors of data or matching tuples on the fly um, and do, do, do faster joins that way. So the basic idea is, uh, when, you, when you're doing a scan on, say, a columnar index, if the predicate you're trying to do a join on, if the, if the position of that tuple in the columnar index matches your predicate, then instead of storing the record ID, you just have a bitmap and you say, at position 4, you know, I set it to 1 because I know tuple, or tuple 4 in my columnar index uh, should be used in the join operation. So again, this is the standard approach used in in most uh, OLAP columnar databases, and this is something that they add, had to add in their system. OK, so since 2012, since the paper you guys read, they came back and added support for all the things that were wrong or missing in the initial implementation of the columnar indexes. So I think in, in SQL Server 2014 and 2016, they sort of have all the things that I'm talking about here. So the first is that they're going to add support for cl uh, clustered columnar indexes. So basically, the idea here is that now the columnar indexes can be the primary storage location of the, the table itself, and you don't need to have the separate copy of the rows. Um, they're adding more support for different data types, because I think in the initial version it was only varchars and a few ints and things like that. So the more complex things, can, uh, objects that they support, can now be in the columnar indexes. And then they also add support to modify these tables. So they no longer need to be classified as read-only. Now you can do all the insert, up, and delete operations that you would normally do uh, an LTP system directly on the, the columnar data, um, or, or a table of columnar indexes. And you can do all this in the context of a transaction, just as you would in a regular uh, table in SQL Server. But again, as I said, you don't want to do modifications directly on the column store because it's be really expensive to do. So instead, they use this delta store approach where they sort of buffer all the modifications. And then there's a background thread that every so often applies those changes. Maybe needs to recompute the encoding scheme and update the compression uh, algorithms for, for each of the columns. We'll talk more about this uh, on, in the next class. But basically, all the things as you were reading this were like, oh, this seems terrible. Why would everyone want to do this? They fixed all those things in the newer stuff. OK? So any questions about columnar indexes? Yes? So his question is, or state, your the statement is that you would not want to use columnar indexes for regular OTP workloads. If you are doing the encoding and stuff. Correct, yes. If you, if you don't do it, then you can use it, uh, then you can use it. 
so his statement is, if you don't do any kind of compression, could you just, could you still do, uh, could you still do transactions and updates on uncompressed columnar data? Uh, yes and no. You could. It could potentially be slow because when you think about it before, in a row store, say I insert a new tuple, right? I, I have a byte stream or a byte array that says, here's all the values of my tuple. I just append that to the end of the table and it's in there. In the case of a, a columnar data store, I have to split it up, every attribute up to, for every single column that exists and do a, a mem copy or mem write to all of those locations. It's not as bad as writing to disk, but it's a little bit more work. Um, the, typically what everyone does is have a, sort of a delta store. It's the right way to do this. Right? It's not that much more work to, to, you know, you still get the fast writes that you want to the row store side, but then over time as things get colder, you can move it to the, to the column store. So Hyper does sort of something similar like this. But we'll see, we'll see next class when we talk about HANA um, and high rise and some other guys, they, they always have the Delta store. And you think of like how this would work in a sort of, in a bifurcated environment. So if you have sort of one database system that's the OLTP side and one database system that's the, that's the OLAP side, it's basically doing the same thing, right? Because the row store is always going to be faster for transactions. Okay, that's a good point. All right, so now I want to switch over and talk about bitmap indexes. So bitmap index is going to be essentially the same kind of thing that we talked about in a columnar projection index, but now instead of storing individual values, we're going to just store bits to say whether, that, whether the tuple of that offset has that value or not. So for every single unique value we're going to have in our column or in our attribute, we're going to have a separate bitmap vector for it. And we're going to say the bit is set to one, if the tuple at that position is, has that particular value. So typically what happens is, say you're going to break up your bitmap, instead of having just one giant array, you'll break it up into segments, and that way, you know, if your bitmap is one gigabyte, you're not calling malloc you know, for an entire gigabyte chunk. You can break it up into smaller pieces, and that's better, better for memory management. So let's look back at this example we had before. We have the, the sex column. So in this case here, instead of storing uh, a single column that has male, female, male, female, we're going to split this up into two separate vectors. And so we'll have one vector that corresponds to whether the attribute has, is male, and one would be whether the attribute is female. And again, I realize now I'm, I'm, this is a bad example because I'm storing two bit vectors for this one column when I could have just used one uh, in its original form, but it's just to, again to show you the idea. So now what can happen is if we want to say at position four, what attribute does it have? If it's, I look, I look across for every, every of these values and I see whether the value is set to one or not, and that will tell me what the original value was, right? So normally what happens is there's a hash table that says for this particular value, and then it points to the, 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 the bit vector for that value. So let's look at another example. So let's say that I go back to my customer, customer dimension table, and now I want to build a bitmap for, on zip code. A bitmap index for zip code. Would this be a good idea or a bad idea? Let's say I have 10 million, I have 10 million customers. How many zip codes are in the US? What's that? He says that most 100,000. Anybody else want to take a guess? It's like 43,000, okay? So if I build a, a, bitmap, vector, a bitmap index, for every single value that I could possibly have in a zip code, I would have to do 43,000 different bitmaps. And each bitmap needs to have 10 million positions or 10 million bits because I don't know whether, you know, what, what bit a customer is going to have set. So in this case here, to store a bitmap index for the zip code table with 10 million tuples, I would need 53 gigabytes if I just stored it uncompressed. So the bitmaps are awesome. Uh, and they work really well if the number of values are, is, is small. Because again, you, doesn't, you always have to store one, one bitmap that includes all the tuples that exist in your table for every single unique value. So you need to be careful about how you choose these things. Um, another problem we have too is that any time that someone inserts a new tuple, if we just append it to the end, then we need to, we have to extend the, the length of all our bitmap vectors. So if we have sort of the example that I, I was sort of 
gave with him earlier about, say, if I insert a tuple in a column store, I have to update all the, the columns. If I have 43,000 bitmaps uh, for this table, anytime I insert a new tuple, I have to update 43,000 of them to say, here's, here's the new length of your bitmap. So again, you have to, it's not the same as a columnar index. It's more general purpose and can take any value. But for special cases, we can do much better than the columnar indexes that the, the Microsoft guys are talking about. So in particular, I'm going to spend some time talking about the different design choices you have to make when you build a bitmap index. Yes? I'm slightly confused. So if the bitmap, if the bit representation of the data type you were originally stored yes. is smaller than the number of values it can contain? It's not, it's not, it doesn't matter what the size of the value is. It's ha so, how many are there? How many discrete values do we have? Sure. So an int is a 64 bit field. Yes. And it can have two to the 64 combinations. Yeah, correct. And so uh, any int can be represented in 64 bits. Correct. But if you want to build a bit vector of 43,000 possible values, yes. anything more than 64 is bad, right? Correct, yes. Okay. Right, so, so this is like we're applying knowledge of the application domain. So it, an int actually. So this is pretty 32 bits. I keep it simple. Uh, in my application, I would know that I only have 43,000 zip codes, right? Right. So I could build an index on this thing, but I probably wouldn't. If, if instead of zip code, this was state, there's only 50 states, so that would be you know f 10 million times 50. That'd be much, that would be much smaller. And that'd be better than storing either the, you know the the, the two you know two eight byte varchar. For you know, 16 byte bar chart for the, uh, the the state code, or you know integer to a, to, a, to a lookup table, the bitmap vector will be much faster for that, much much better. Right, and this is sort of like what DBAs do. DBAs say, well, what, what what does my application look like? What does the data look like? And can make decisions about what bit, what vector, what kind of indexes it wants to include. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about the different ways to build out bitmaps. So I want to talk about the encoding scheme. Uh, and I'll talk about how to do compression on these things as well. So the type of encoding we've talked about so far is called a quality coding. Basically, it says for this position, the, the tuple at this offset has this particular value if the bit is set to 1 in my bitmap vector. Right? And this allows you to do basically only quality predicates because you can say, find me all the customers that are in zip code 15217, and you do a one, you know, uh, you just do a lookup in each one, and you find whether that bit is set to true, and that knows that tells you what value it actually is. But again, we saw that this gets wastes a lot of space because in the case of the zip code, when you think about it, the probability that a bit will be set to 1 is, if you assume, if you assume uniform distribution of population in different zip codes, is 1, to the 43, 1 divided by 43,000. So chances are the, the bit is always going to be 0. So instead of storing you know, exactly whether the bit is, is 1 or not for each, each tuple, you can do range encoding where you can say, I have a bitmap that represents an interval of values, and I'll say whether it's still 1 or 0 based on whether the value of that particular tuple is, is within that range. So I could have, say, for example, instead of having, say, zip codes 15217, 15213, and 15215, instead of having a separate bitmap for each of those th three of them, I'll say, I'll have a bitmap that says, if the zip code is within this range, then I know whether that's, you know, I'll, I'll set it one or, one or not. And that's actually an example of a lossy compression scheme because I have no way to go back and say what exactly zip code did I have for that particular tuple. I just know whether it's, in, you know, whether it's, with, whether it's within the interval. Another approach uh, is called byte sliced encoding. And this is kind of cool because this is instead of storing uh, the actual, you know, ones or zeros based on whether a tuple has the value or not, we're going to encode the actual values of the tuples themselves in these bitmaps and allow us to do other more complicated things. So let's look at an example here. So they say we have a table here of all the zip codes. So these are all the zip codes of the locations I lived at in my life. Um, I guess there's eight different places I lived. And then what we'll do is we'll take the first one here, 21042, and then instead of, again, storing a, uh, a single bitmap for 21042, we're going to instead break this up into slices for all the positions of bits that it has in the actual value itself. So if we call the bin function, like in Python, we would get this bit sequence for this particular value. 
And then in our index, what we'll store is a single bitmap that says whether the value is, is null or not. So you can think of it, we're going to go down uh, vertically. Each row in, in the, the bit slices will correspond to a particular tuple. And then these uh, positions along this, th these correspond to the positions in the, in the uh, bit sequence. So in this case here, we're have, we always have to keep one bitmap to say whether the value is null or not. In this case, it's not. And then we'll go down, again, slide across all these bits we fill out into, into these separate slices. And then we can repeat this, again, going down all the other tuples and flesh out all of these, uh, these bitmaps. So again, we're not looking horizontally. At bit slice 16, here's all the, uh, here's all the values that, 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 that for each of the tuple. So now what this is going to allow us to do in this representation is we can take queries like find me all the customers where the zip code is less than uh, 15217, and then we can walk through the slice and construct a result bitmap of all the tuples where this predicate is set to true. But we can do some optimizations and know that in the case of 15217, it has the first three bits set to zero. So when we examine these slices, we can throw out anything that has a one in any of these cases or in any of these bit slices. So it allows us to completely skip looking at these tuples in, in its entirety. And we can use some of the modern vector, vectorized execution instructions in, in chips to do these operations very, very quickly. And beyond that, we can actually even use these, these bit slices to do aggregations very efficiently as well, which is going to be much faster than, again, doing sequential scans. So for example, say we want to do a summation. What we could do is then all we have to do is compute the number of ones in each slice and multiply that by 2 to the whatever the slice offset it is. And then we can do this for the, for the next slice, so on and so on. And we add that together. And that's the sum of all the numbers for, in our entire table for this particular attribute. And what's really awesome about this, doing these bit slices, is that computing the number of ones in a slice can be done using like a Hamming code instruction. So it's a single instruction of the CPU that will give you back the number of ones within like a 64-bit word. So that's really, really fast, and that's, you know, versus doing a for loop to go everything one by one and adding it together. So we'll talk more about how you use bit slices and vectorized execution instructions when we talk about vectorization later in the class. But this is sort of one advantage you can get when you use a different representation of bitmaps for your data. So I think Sybase supports this, IBM supports this, a lot of, a lot of different database systems can support these type of indexes. Okay. So that's a different encoding scheme we can have for bitmaps. Now let's talk about how to do compression. So again, we saw that zip code example before where it was just to this massive uh, amount of data we have to store for these, these ones and zeros. Um, you could take the, the, the chunks of the, the bitmap and run your sort of you know, off-the-shelf compression scheme to like you know, LZ4, Snappy, um, GZIP, or whatever, and compress those segments to reduce the amount of space that, that, that you're using for them. The problem with this approach is that anytime you need to access or compute something on those bitmap vectors, you have to decompress it. So it helps in a disk-based system because you can, you can compress it before you write the block out the disk. In an in-memory system, you're basically wasting CPU cycles to decompress and uncompress things. So that doesn't help you. So another two approaches are to do uh, an encoding scheme called byte-aligned bitmap codes, and this is from, from Oracle. And the basic idea of what we're going to do here, and I'll show an example, is that we're going to use structured run length encoding of, of the data itself. So we're going to use run length encoding, um, but rather than just having this arbitrary sequence of things, we can be more sophisticated on how we laid out the compressed version of them. And then I'll talk about roaring bitmaps. So roaring bitmaps was invented by some French Canadians uh, a few years ago. Um, so the algorithm is actually very, very new. And actually, the paper was actually published this year or last year in 2015. But it's actually now being used in uh, some a lot of open source systems like Spark and Lucene and Hive. So this is one of those things where like the open source guys are maybe first to adopt this kind of technique, um, and the commercial guys don't don't quite know about it yet, which I think is kind of cool. All right, so let's talk about what, or what Oracle does. So this approach, the basic idea we're going to do here is that we're going to split the bitmap into chunks based on what, what sequences of bytes we see. And we're going to categorize bytes based on, on, on two groups. So the first is we're going to have gap bytes that correspond to bytes where everything's zero. And then we'll have tail bytes where at least one of the bits in the byte is set to one. Again, when you think about like, you know, uh, the zip code example I had before, most of the, the bits are going to be set to zero, right? 
because most people, you know, you know, most people aren't going to live in certain zip codes, and you have a one over, you know, forty-three thousand chance of something being set to one. So we're going to be able to exploit that by doing run length encoding on large sequences of zeros. And so once we find a chunk uh, that has a bunch of gap bytes followed by some tail bytes, we're going to encode them in such a way uh, that that we can get much low, much less storage overhead um, than what we would get if we stored everything uncompressed. So I'll show you an example here. So let's say we have a sequences of, I think these are 18 bytes. So the first thing you'll see is that most of them are zero. Only these two bytes, here and here and here, do we see we actually have something set to one. So these are going to be our, our tail bytes, right? Whereas everything else here is going to be gap bytes. So anytime we see a tail byte, we would chunk this up. Uh, so this is the first chunk, and we have the tail bytes and the gap bytes. And then here's our second chunk. Now, for each chunk, we're going to go through and figure out how to encode it in, in, into a smaller space. So for the first guy, we always have to write out a header. And the header is going to tell us what is in our sequence. So the first three bits are going to say the number of gap bytes we have. So in this case here, we have two. And then we'll have a special bit to say whether the tail is something special or not. And we'll say it's special as if it only has one bit set to one. And that way, we can encode where that position is in the, in, in the sequence without storing the entire thing. So, so in this case here, we have two gap bytes. So we'd store that in the first three bits. Then we'd have a flag to say that it's special and set that to one. And then we would say where in the position it is. So that's what we have here. So I'm sort of drawing the parentheses to show you where the, the, the chunks are in the header. So that means for these three bytes in our, in our bitmap, we only need one byte to, to represent it. Now, if we go to the next chunk, we have, see, we have 13 gap bytes. So we have 13 bytes sequences that are all zeros. Um, and so we can't store that in our three bit in the header because it's greater than seven. So we'll set a, all of these to one to say that we'll tell you later on how many gap byte sequences we have. And then because we have two verb uh, verbatim or two tail byte sequences here, and they're not special because this one doesn't have a, uh, has two ones, whereas this one has one. Uh, that means we need to store a flag to say, we're going to store these entire byte sequences in, uh, as exact copies, and here's how many we have. So in this case here, the second chunk can be represented like this. We have our header. Then we have our gap length, which is 13, because we have 13 byte sequences here. And then we have our verbatim tail bytes that are exact copies of the data here. So in this case here, our original byte sequence for this bitmap was 18 bytes. But now, in the compressed version, we can do this in five bytes. Again, but taking advantage of run length encoding. I'm being very hand wavy and very fast about how you should do this. Uh, you never, unless you go to work, work at Oracle, you're never going to have to implement this because this is obviously patented by them. But it just begins to show there's other mechanisms that, that there's other ways to exploit run length encoding for repeated sequences to get better compression. So the the BBC approach from Oracle, I don't know whether that's still what they use, but in some ways, it's kind of obsolete format because it was developed in the 1990s, and it doesn't take advantage of all the vectorized execution instructions you can have in modern CPUs. There's a better approach called write-aligned hybrid uh, encoding. Uh, that is, the problem with that is it's actually patented. I don't know who owns the patent, but most people don't implement that, that either because you know, they want to avoid any patent issues. The other key thing to understand about both the BBC and the general compression approach is that none of these allow for random access. Meaning anytime you want to figure out what, whether position is set to 1 or not, you have to decompress the entire thing. Right? And that can be really, really slow. And so the, a more modern approach is called roaring bitmaps. And the basic idea here is that we're going to store some of the data in uh, uncompressed bitmaps and some of the data as just regular valueless. And then that way you can get the sort of best, best of both worlds. Right? The valueless very quickly to see whether something's in a set or not. And the bitmap, we can do all the regular uh, vectorized bitmap execution operations that we saw when we talked about byte slicing. So again, a quick overview of how, what it looks like. So at this upper level, you're going to have this, these, these, this partitioning table that says, for all the chunks in my key space, here's a container that stores all the data for it. And so some of the containers will store things as regular 60-bit, 16-bit integers. Some of them will be stored them as, 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 as bitmaps. So the idea is that for each value we get, we first need to figure out what chunk it should be in, what container we want to store it in. So we want to divide the number by 2 to the 16. And then we take that number, and then we we'll only have to store the, the mod of 2 to the 16 
in the actual container itself. And that's enough for us to be able to reverse it back and get back the original value. So if the number of values in the container is less than 4096, I don't know whether that's the default, but that's what Lucene does, then you just store it as a valueless array. Otherwise, you're going to store it as a bitmap. And then you can do all, again, the vectorized stuff on this. And again, this works because when you have a small number of lists, storing a small number of values, storing it as a bitmap is really bad. Um, but in this, and when it gets too large, then you store it in bitmap is better. All right, so let's look at an example. Say you have n equals 1,000. The first thing you do is divide it by 2 to the 16, which comes out to be 0. I guess you take the floor of that. And then you mod the number by 2 to the 16, and then that gives you 1,000. So that's the only thing we need to store. And we can easily reverse that to get back the original value. So let's say that we have this other arbitrarily large number here. We do divide by 2 to the 16. That gives us chunk 3. And then the number we have to store in our bitmap now is, is 50. So what we're going to do is that we just find the 50th position in our bitmap, and we set that to be 1. And now we can easily, you know, we know that, uh, we know that this, whether the, the roaring bitmap contains, you know, it sets a true for that offset. Does this sort of make sense? So there's some open source implementations of this. Uh, and again, this is actually actually being used in a lot more systems now, even though it's actually a new algorithm. You think about like skip lists. Skip lists were invented in the 90s, and it wasn't until 20 years later that databases actually started using it. Um, whereas this is something that people are picking up pretty early on. OK, so to finish up about OLAB indexes, the one thing you should be mindful of is, and we'll talk more about this next class, is this is, all these schemes assume that the position of a tuple in a table is fixed throughout the life of the tuple. Meaning if I, if I get inserted at position 5, no matter if I come back and get updated again, I'm always going to be at position 5. But this doesn't work in a system that uses MVCC with the insert method because when you insert a tuple, if you modify it, you make a new version of it, and now its position is going to be somewhere different. MySQL doesn't have this problem, and Oracle doesn't have this problem because they're using the rollback setting, so you always have a fixed position for a tuple. But in something like Postgres, you can't do this because, again, the position is going to be changing all over. So this is why we're going to have to look, to look at delta stores to get around the problem of updating things when we have a bitmap or a columnar index. We talked about this as well. Maintain the bitmap index is wasteful if there's a large number of unique values. And so you'd be, you'd be very careful about you know, when you choose to use a bitmap index. Another key thing is that we're completely ignoring multi-dimensional uh, predicates or multi-dimensional range queries. We've been assuming things like, you know, is the zip code equal to this or is, is the zip code less than that? If you have more complex predicates, combining these things or doing things at, at, in a multi-dimensional uh, attribute space becomes very complicated and bitmap vectors, bitmap indexes may not be the right thing. You want to use like KD trees or RD trees and we're, we're ignoring all that for now. Okay, any questions about columnar indexes? Any questions about... Uh, Bitmap indexes. OK, project two. So the goal for project two, the, the, what you're assigned to do is everyone has to implement a latch-free BW tree in our database system. Right? So you don't get to choose what index you, you have to do, because we decided since skip lists are too easy, everyone would, would pick that, and that wouldn't be that interesting. So everyone has to implement a BW tree. And you need to support all the things that I talked about last class in your BW trees. So you need to support the compare and swap mapping table for indirection. You need to support the delta chaining. You need to support split, merge, and consolidation. And you need to support the cooperative garbage collection. So you need to be able to have your threads identify, I need to do garbage collection using the, the epoch timestamp approach and clean up any pages that, that can be uh, deleted. So the, your, your index is going to be, we're, we're going to provide you with a standard API of all the, the functions your thing needs to support. But your, your index needs to be able to support both unique and non-unique keys. So if it's a unique index, if I insert the same value you're twice, you try, you're, the second time I try to insert it, you should come back with false. In non-unique, you should be able to accept a new one over and over again. And, but if I call it delete, I'm going to give you back the, um, a particular key and a pointer to the tuple, and you'll be able to, f to find the right one to actually delete. Right? So the we're going to provide you with a header file that has, again, the API that you have to implement. And all of sort of the nitty gritty details of how to do data serialization, unserialization, and a predicate evaluation is completely taken care of for you. So you don't have to examine what's actually in the key we give you. We'll give you a comparator that you can use to then say, you know, is this thing less than, than that thing? 
But as you go along, uh, you'll see that there's all these things that sort of they were hand wavy about in the paper that it's up to you to figure out how to actually implement correctly. So for example, what you set for the threshold when you decide to garbage collect or consolidate a, uh, a, a delta chain, it's up to you to decide what the right number is. And you can play with the different test cases we give you to, to figure out what a good value is for that. Um, I can't stress this enough. As you go along, there's all these questions you're going to have about how you actually implement things. And I'll say there's no right answer. And it's better for you guys as a group to sit and figure out what should we actually be doing rather than come to Joy and I and say, you know, what's the right answer to do this? What sh how should we do this? Right? You should be more independent about how you design this thing. And as long as you maintain the API and do all the stuff that we, we talked about, you know, it's, it, you know, no one, no one implementation is going to be better than another potentially. Although I guess we can, we can measure to see which one is actually better using speed tests. Um, so just like before, we're going to provide you with C++ test cases for you to check your implementation. We strongly encourage you to write additional test cases uh, to, to, to play with things because what we're providing you with you is, gonna be, is not going to include all the things we're going to grade you on. So you need to be careful about all the different corner cases you have to worry about when you do splits and consolidations and merging. And we may not provide you with test cases that cover everything. To check to see whether your thing is correct, we can provide you an existing index implementation that is based on the STX B plus tree, which is an open source B plus tree implementation. But the difference between this implementation we're giving you and the one you're implementing is that this implementation does not do concurrent operations. Right? The, the STX B plus tree is not thread safe. So we're using a coarse grain lock for any single operation you do inside of your index. So anytime you do an insert, we lock the B plus tree. Anytime you do an update, we lock the B plus tree. So this will allow you to be, have an oracle to say, is my index correct? Because you can load up yours and load up this other one, and you should come back with the same, th same values and roughly the same structure in some ways. Um, but your thing should be, be able to outperform our implementation, right? Because this thing is, is doing the most simple way to do locking, whereas your thing needs to be more fine-grained and doing compare and swap. Uh, I don't think we're providing you with any SQL tests, uh, so everything will be done, but you can do everything from the command line just, just as before. The other thing we're require you to do is actually write documentation or commenting your code to make sure you explain what you're doing. So since we're splitting up in groups, we're only going to have 10 submissions. So Joy and I are actually going to go look at your code and see whether it's actually structured correctly and actually explaining all the different parts of, of, of your implementation. So if we see code that looks like you just wrote a bunch of stuff and it's not clear what the hell is actually going on, you would, you would lose points for that. right? Because the idea is that when you go out in the real world, when you go out into a company, if you wrote code without documenting what you were doing, you'd probably get fired. They'd probably reprimand you. So when you, you want to get you in the habit of actually writing you know, production quality code now, uh, and that way we, we can correct any mistakes that you may have along the way. For grading, again, we're, again, we're going to have additional tests beyond what we provide you. Uh, again, we're going to have bonus points to whoever actually writes the fastest implementation. So hopefully, all of you should be able to beat Joy. Right? You definitely should be able to beat his coarse grain B plus tree locking scheme, but all of you should be able to beat his B, B, BW tree implementation because he'll spend less time on it than you guys did. Uh, and of course, again, we're going to do the same thing where you have to pass the client format syn syntax checking so that way everybody's code looks, looks nice and clean and uniform with the rest of the code in, this, in the system. So you saw my email on Friday. Everyone should be assigned to a group now. I think we actually had one person drop out this morning, so we have 29 people but I think we're going to go in the waiting list and bring somebody else in. So every group should have uh, three people. And the expectation is that there's not going to be one person carrying the torch for the entire group. right? I'm not your babysitter, so I'm not going to go check on GitHub to see whether you know, everyone has the equal number of commits. And so it's up for you guys to manage yourself and say you know, everyone's contributing equally. Right? I don't want to get emails saying, like, oh, this person's a dick. They're not doing enough work. Right? Everyone should be doing the same amount of work. OK? So the due date will be March 2nd, and again, due at midnight, and that, that'll be a Wednesday. It's the Wednesday before spring break. Um, and then full description and links to the source code, and everything is now available online on the course website. So any questions about project two? None? Everyone can, everyone can go write a BW tree in, the, in spare time on a weekend, right? It's that easy. All right, people are shaking their heads yes. OK. All right. Uh, so for next class, we'll now start talking about storage models. And again, we've been sort of 
dancing around this idea of deltal stores and other things like that. So we'll talk more about that on, on, on Wednesday. And then Joy will spend the last 15 minutes of class talking about how to do performance profiling in, in the Peloton system. Again, so you, how you hook up GDB, run perf, gprof, and all these other things to figure out what your index is actually doing, figure out where the hot spots are, why things are going slow, and how to optimize your code further. So we'll spend some time and give a quick tutorial on how to do this. Okay? All right, see you guys next time.